Well, it's time for us to begin. We do appreciate everyone being here this evening. We are studying in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, actually, our lesson goes into chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, but uh, we'll see if we get that far tonight or not. We'll begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for all that you've given us and all that you do for us, and thank you that we have this opportunity to come together and study from your word and we pray, Lord, that you will help us as we study to understand better about you and help us to understand better about how we can live for you and serve you in our lives. And We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us when we do wrong. We pray for those that are sick, for those that are having surgery, those who have had surgeries and taking treatments, and just pray your blessings on each one and give them health if it's your will and help us to know how to encourage Pray that you'll be with us as a church, that we can reach out to those that are lost and encourage those that are weak. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. It's too warm. That's got to go. We are in 1 Samuel. We are really ready for chapter 25. We have been studying about David uh, and Saul and Jonathan, and uh, as we look at this chapter, uh, it says that Samuel died, uh, that's verse 1, and so this is a, a major event. It's interesting how sometimes such a major event can have such small uh, announcement. And yet Samuel was the last uh, of the judges. Uh, he had actually judged Israel for most of his life. Uh, and, and so he had uh, been in this position. You remember this, the Israel wanted a king and he felt rejected. And God said, let them have a king. They got King Saul. And then Saul didn't obey God and didn't do what was right. And because of that, then... Uh, God rejected Saul, uh, and Samuel at that point told him he wouldn't see him anymore. Uh, and so he, he left him, uh, and, and Saul then began his downfall with all of his problems and issues and his rebellion against God and, and so on. And, and David was anointed king by Samuel, uh, and so David has been fleeing from Saul up to this point. Uh, in our lesson, and, and Saul's been trying to kill him, and so now Samuel has died. A uh, little story here in chapter 25 about a man named Nabal. Uh, he owned uh, a lot of farm in, uh, in Carmel and had a lot of sheep, had a lot of goats, and it became shearing time. And this was always a festive time. Uh, the people that had crops when it was harvest time, they would have a big uh, festivity. It was a big deal for them. And they'd gather all their crops and they'd do their grain. And if you remember the story of Ruth and the threshing floor and so on, and they had this, you know, like a big party uh, because it was harvest time. And now it's shearing time. And so people had sheep and goats. They would shear the sheep and the goats. and uh, it was a it was a big party for them, and so Nabal uh, was having his big shearing party, and David heard about it. And David and his men had been protecting Nabal's shepherds, uh, watching out for them and making sure that nothing happened. And uh, and so David sent some of his men. I think it was ten of his young men up to Nabal and said. Uh, our master David has sent us and he said uh, we've been looking out for your people and we'd like for you to share some of the food and the party party goods that you have uh, with with us and Nabal said who is David who's Jesse I don't know this guy he said anybody can go out and have a band of people by themselves and and act any way they want to he said I, I'm not sending anything up there I'm not gonna waste my stuff on this guy named David well, the men went back and told David, and David was extremely angry. 
Uh, and so he told his men uh, to put on their swords, uh, and they did. Uh, and he, uh, it's 400, I that's what I was looking for. See, I mean, I was thinking it's 400, but we'll say that without knowing for sure. 400 of David, David and 400 of his men head up to where Nabal is, and David is mad. He, he's really hot, and he, he tells his men, he said, by morning there won't be a male left among Nabal's people. We're going to go up there, we're going to kill Nabal, and everybody belongs to him. Uh, and what it doesn't say is then they would just take his stuff. That would, that would be the, the way they would do it. Well, one of Nabal's young servants heard what went on. And he immediately went to uh, Nabal's wife, who was named Abigail, uh, and it, it says that Nabal was a very uh, rough man. He was a very foolish man. Nabal was a very beautiful woman. I mean, Abigail was a very beautiful woman. Uh, and so they told Abigail. And it's interesting, the guy said, he said, you know your husband, nobody can talk to him. And so she said, okay. So she prepared all this food uh, for David and his men. Uh, and she sent some of her servants ahead and told them, if you get to David before I do, you tell him, hang on a minute, I'm coming. And so she came to him. Uh, and uh, when she got there, uh, she bowed down to David and she said, this is all my fault and I'm sorry, but uh, my husband is a foolish man. In fact, his name is Nabal, and Nabal means fool. That's what it means. And so he was named appropriately. Uh, and, and she said, uh, she said, one of the men told me, and, and, you know, and I'm sorry for what happened, and please forgive. And I thought there was a, an interesting statement here. Uh, she says, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as his name, so is he. So she said, he's a fool. Uh, Nabal is, is his name, and folly is with him. Uh, and she said, I didn't see your servants that came, and, and I'm sorry. Uh, but now, she said, don't shed blood, because I know that the Lord is with you, and I know the Lord is going to bless you. Uh, and so one of these days you'll look back, if you do this, you'll look back and you will have a guilty conscience because you've killed Nabal and all of his men because you know you shouldn't do that. Uh, and she said, so please forgive the transgression. Uh, and she said, uh, the Lord's going to bless you and the Lord's going to take care of you. Uh, And then she said in verse 31, and I thought this was interesting, when the Lord shall deal well with my Lord, that is David, then remember your maidservant. I thought that was an interesting statement. And in light of what happens, I think that she may have suspected what was going to happen, and she was sort of preparing David for that. Uh, but anyway, David said, okay, he said, I'm glad you stopped me because just as sure as the sun rises, if you hadn't stopped me, I would have killed Nabal and everybody that was with him by morning. Uh, and so uh, he went back home. He took the stuff that she had given. Uh, and so David went back to where he was staying and, and so on. Uh, and so Abigail came to Nabal. Uh, and he was drunk, and so she didn't tell him that night what he, what she had done because he was so drunk that he wouldn't have probably known it or remembered it anyway. So she waited till the next day, and she told him, and it says when she told him that his heart died within him so that he became as a stone. And then ten days later, the Lord struck him, and he died. <clears throat> I've heard all kinds of speculation about what that means. Uh seems to me probably he either had a pretty bad heart attack or he had a bad stroke is, is what I suspect uh, and it's, the fact that his heart was uh, 
and he was like stone. His heart was dead within him. He was like stone. Sort of implies that he was unconscious, uh, it seems to me. Uh, and, and then ten days later, the Lord struck him and he died. Now, David then sends some of his men up to Abigail and says, David wants you to come be his wife. And so she said, okay. So she went and married David. Uh, it says, Abigail rose quickly and rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her and followed the messenger of David and became his wife. And he had also taken a Hinnom uh, of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. And Saul had given Michael his wife to somebody else, uh, Palti. Uh, so this is the story of David's wives and also the story of how he did it and, and so on. Uh, I find it interesting that this story is in there. Uh, because you, you think about all the other stories of David and his exploits and everything else, they all have to do with either with Saul or, or with the Philistines or something as a warrior or whatever. I think this one shows us a side of David that makes us realize David was more human than we sometimes think he was. He was more like us. He, just, he lost his temper over all of this. It really, really made him mad, and he's going to get even with it. And that, that tells you something about David. Normally, David didn't do that. There are other instances where David was, was provoked just as much as he was here, maybe even more so. And yet he refused to, to avenge himself and, and take vengeance. Uh, he would always just say, I'll leave it up to the Lord. I'll let the Lord take care of it. Uh, but here he, he was ready to go fight. Uh, and, and Abigail persuaded him to not do that. All right, any questions, comments on, on that? Anybody? Any thoughts anybody want to add? Or? Okay. Uh, the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah and said, David's hiding down here where we are in the wilderness of Ziph. So Saul sent 3,000 men. Uh, David heard about it, that he was coming. Uh, and and I, I think it's interesting, too, that this is not the only time that it specifically mentions that Saul took 3,000 men with him to hunt David. I mean, that's, that's like a major, you know, like taking the whole army with him to find one person. Uh, and that's, that's always been interesting to me. Uh, so David uh, sort of hid himself from Saul, and then Saul lay down to sleep that night, uh, and he had a circle of the camp. Uh, Abner was his bodyguard, his armor bearer, the cap captain of his army, uh, Abner was his right hand man Abner it says was laying around him so I'm not sure exactly but he certainly was right there close to him Saul's spear was stuck in the ground beside him and so David uh, took with him Abishai uh, and they go into the camp and Abishai said to David, he says, let me strike him. I won't have to hit him but one time. And he said, I'll pin him to the ground. He'll be dead. Uh, sort of reminds me of uh, jail uh, when, when she killed Sisera with the tent peg. Uh, he, he says, you just let me have one shot. That's all it'll take. Uh, and, and he'll be dead. And David, David said, no, why wouldn't David let him kill him? Okay, he was the Lord's anointed. And not this time, but the other time when Abishai wanted to kill him. It was Abishai the other time too. And David said, no, he's the Lord's anointed. David went on and he said, when God gets ready for him to die, he'll die. And when God gets ready for me to take over the kingdom, he'll give it to me. God had already promised it to David. 
So David knew that he was going to be the next king, and David knew that Saul was going to have to die first before, before he'd be a king. But he says, I'm not going to do it. The Lord anointed him, and I am not going to overstep my bounds, and we're not going to kill the Lord's anointing. And, and that tells us the side of David that we usually think about when we think about David. Uh, this is really sort of the opposite of what's going on back in chapter 25 because with David. Because over there, he's just really mad and he's ready to go fight and, uh, you know, kill Nabal and his people. Here, he refuses to do it because even though Saul's trying to kill him, he's got 3,000 men hunting David. And, and so he, he, gets it, he gets his water bottle and he gets Saul's spear. And then they leave the camp, they go across the ravine where they're safe distance from him. And then he hollers out. The other time he called out to Saul, if you'll remember. This time he doesn't call out to Saul. He calls out to Abner. And he says, Abner, aren't you supposed to be the king's bodyguard? He said, you deserve to die because uh, we were close enough to him to kill him. You weren't there to protect him. He said, look, see, if you'll look and see, his spear is gone and so is his water bottle. We got it over here. Uh, and Saul heard what was going on, and he says, Is that you, David? And he said, It is. Uh, and I, I thought it was interesting. Let me back up verse 15 of chapter 26. David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Uh, why then have you not guarded the king? For one of the people came to destroy the king, your Lord. And he said, This thing should not have been done. It's not good. Uh, so he... <laughs> He really chides Abner, but David says, uh, it is me, uh, my lord the king. And he said, David said, why are you pursuing me? What have I done wrong? You tell me what I've done wrong. He said, uh, listen to me. I had the opportunity to kill you. I didn't kill you. Uh, he said, so, you know, why, why am I having to live as an exile? I could be back home and living with my people. And Saul said, I've sinned. He said, you can come back home. He said, I've played the fool. I promise I won't do anything to hurt you. Uh, and so David said, okay, here's the spear and the water bottle, and you let one of your young men come get it. Uh, and they have it back, and so he did. And uh, he said, the Lord will pay, repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. He said, because the Lord delivered you into my hand today, and I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointing. Uh, and so Saul said blessed are you my son David you will both accomplish much and surely prevail so David went on his way and Saul returned to his palace uh, I find that again I find this the, one of these this stories to be very interesting as you read this you would think okay Saul says I'm sorry Saul says I'm not going to hurt you anymore you can come back home everything will be fine but the next chapter, David doesn't go back home. He goes down to the Philistines. Why didn't David just go back home? Saul's promised he's not going to hurt him. Okay. Yeah. There had been at least three previous occasions where Saul and David had had this same conversation, and Saul said, I'm sorry, I've done wrong, I promise I won't hurt you. Uh, and then it wasn't long, he tried to kill him again. You know, and David confronted him, he said, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm wrong, you know, you're a better man than I am, I won't hurt you. Uh, and he, then, so not a little, a little bit later, he tries to kill him again. So David, uh, he may be a lot of things, but he ain't dumb. <laughs> So he said, forget this stuff. I'm not going to go back uh, up there. And so he said, one of these days, he's going to kill me. He said, I'm going to go down and live with the Philistines. And so David went down and lived uh, with the Philistines. And he went to Achish, who is the king of Gath. Now, there are five major Philistine cities. And there are five kings or five lords of the Philistines. And each one of these major cities has a king that's, that's over them, and, and so it's sort of a federation. They don't really have a central government. They've got a, a 
a federation of five regions with one king over each of the five, and they work together. Uh, and, and so a lot of times they'll go out and fight together. And a lot of times when you read about the Philistines, they'll talk about the five cities of the Philistines, and then sometimes they'll talk about three of them, and there'll be three of them that'll go do something together or whatever. But David goes down to Achish, and uh, he, who is king of Gath, and uh, he carries with him his men, he carries his uh, wives with him, uh, and so Saul heard, well, David's fled down to, to Gath now. He's living in the Philistines, uh, with the Philistines. And so he said, forget him. And so he quit trying to chase him. So Saul really did quit trying to, to chase him here. Uh, then David said to Achish, he said, if I found favor in your sight, let me live with you and live down here. And apparently he had been there for a while and sort of won his trust a little bit. And uh, he said, give me a place to live. And he said, okay, you can have uh, the city of Ziklag, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah, Ziklag. And so David then lived in Ziklag from that point on. And in fact then, after David leaves the Philistines and he becomes king of Israel, Ziklag remains a part of Israel. It was right near the border. And, and Ziklag becomes uh, one of the cities of Israel of Israel and stays a city of Israel. But David lived in Ziklag. Now, interestingly, uh, and, and what he says in the book is, is not correct, and I'm sorry to say that, but it is. Uh, but he, he says that, that David would go out and he would fight against enemies of the Philistines, and in doing that, uh, he was winning the favor of King Achish. But if you read what it says, he was going and fighting, and he was telling King uh, Achish that he was fighting against the Israelites, the Kenites and the Jezreelites and some others, and these were, were pockets of people that belonged to Israel. And, and that's not where he was going. He was fighting against the Amalekites and I think the Perizzites or somebody, and and so he was uh, he was... He was going and fighting against these people, but each time he would go and fight against them, he would make sure that he killed everybody there so that nobody could go back and tell King Achish what he was doing. And so all this time, Achish is thinking that David is going and fighting against pockets of the Israelites, and so he really thinks, okay, man, he's on our side now. He's totally left Israel. He don't have any you know, allegiance to them and they're going to hate him because, you know, he's fighting against them, but he's not. He's fighting against uh, the enemies of Israel is who he's fighting against. But it specifically says that he killed all of them so that Achish would not get word of where he had gone and what he had done. And so how the author of the book came up with what he did, I don't know. Uh but look at verse 10, he said, uh, verse 8, he says, David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites and the Gerzites and the Amalekites, and they were inhabitants of the land from ancient times. And David attacked the land, did not leave a man or woman alive, and took the sheep and the cattle and donkeys and so on, and returned to Achish. And Achish said, uh, where have you been? And he said, the Negev of Judah against the Negev of the Jeremelites and against the Kenites. Uh, and that's not where he was going. That's not where he was fighting. So uh, it, anyway, it says David didn't leave a man alive lest they tell him. Uh, and he said he'd been doing that ever since he'd been living there. So Achish said he surely made himself odious among his people Israel. Therefore, he'll be my servant forever. So Achish really felt good about him. And he sort of decided, okay, I'm going to promote David. And so the, the five kings of the Philistines were going up to fight against Israel. And Achish tells David, he says, okay, you've got to go with me. Uh, you know, since I've been taking care of you, since you've been living here, uh, you have to go as one of us, and you're going to go up and fight with us against Israel. David said, that's fine. We'll do that. And so he took his army, his own personal army, and he joined Achish, and they head up to battle uh, to fight against Israel. Well, the other four kings of the Philistines said, hey, looked at Achish, and they said, hey, what are these Hebrews doing here? 
We don't want them going with us because we get up there in the middle of the battle and they're going to say, uh, you know, forget the Philistines and they're going to join them fight against us. And Achis said, no. He said, David has proven himself and, and he's made himself odious to the people of Israel and the king. And, and so you ain't got to, you know, I, I trust him completely. And they said, well, what better way would it be for him to win the favor of the king of Israel than for him to go into battle with us and then turn against us? And so Achish very reluctantly then said, okay, I'll tell him he's got to go home. So he went to David and he said, okay, David, you got to go back home. The other kings have said you can't go with us. And he said, why not? He said, hadn't I always been faithful to you? Hadn't I always done everything, you know, the way you would want me to do it? And, and what have I ever done to make you doubt me? And, and Achy said, nothing. He said, it's not you. I trust you. But the other king said, you can't go. And so, you know, you're going to have to go back home. So early in the morning, you get up and you go. So David then got up early the next morning and headed back home. When they got to Ziklag, there had been a band of the Amalekites that had come in and had taken everybody and everything in the city and burned it. They had also raided some other places. David uh, told, uh, is it Abiath or the priest, I believe? I've, I've forgotten. Yeah, Abiathar, verse 7, chapter 30. Okay. He, he called for Abiathar, who was the high priest, uh, and, and he said, bring me the ephod, uh, and, and I want to ask the Lord. And so he brought the ephod to him, and he asked the Lord, he said, should I pursue these Amalekites? And the Lord said, go, you'll, you'll be victorious. And, and so David takes his men and he, he takes off after them. Well, now, they have already marched out to battle. They've already come back from battle. Uh, a bunch of them are tired, so he leaves a couple hundred of them there uh, to look after the stuff that they had, and the other 400 go with it. And so they, they pursue them, and as, as they're getting closer to the Amalekites, they find this Egyptian guy who was... Who was completely almost passed out. He's like wiped out bad, uh, laying out in the field. And they got him some water to drink and got him some food to eat. And finally he perked up a little bit. And they, they asked him who he was and what was going on. And he told them that he was a servant of one of the Amalekites and that he had gotten sick and they just left him to die. And he said, well, what have y'all done? And he told them about where they had raided and told them about burning the city of Ziklag and said, they've got all the people and, and everything there. Uh, and, and so David said, okay. And so then they uh, continue to pursue them. They finally catch up with them, uh, and, and they defeated the Amalekites. They chased them off, killed most of them. There's about a few hundred of them that got away, but most of them they killed. Uh, and then they came back, and, and all the spoil was there. So not only did they take all the spoil that was taken from Ziklag that belonged to them in the first place, but they had raided a whole bunch of other towns along the way and they had taken the spoil from them. And so they got all of that in addition to it. Uh, plus whatever supplies the Amalekites had, they took that. Uh, and so they started back home. Well, when they got pretty close to where the 200 guys were that didn't go with them, the 400 said, hey, look, uh, we're going to keep all this stuff. You know, David, you get your share, and then we're going to keep the rest of it because we're not going, uh, we're not going to share it with them. And David said, "No, that's not right." He said, "Those guys were not able to come, but they stayed there and they watched the baggage and they were there uh, to watch the supplies and protect them. Uh, and so, you will share equally with them. Everybody shares alike." And it says it became a law in Israel from that point on that when they went to battle, the ones that were in the army that didn't actually go to battle got their share of whatever bounty they, they were able to get when they went to battle. Uh, and so they, they came back 
And, and every, they, everybody that had been taken was, was there, including David's two wives. All the families, all the kids, everybody uh, was alive. And so they brought them all back and, and came back to uh, Ziklag. All right. The Philistines now, meanwhile, are fighting against Israel. The battle does not go well for King Saul and for Israel. And it says that uh, they began chasing Saul. Finally, uh, one of the archers hit him, he was badly wounded. He told his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me. He refused to do it. Uh, and so Saul fell on his own spear and killed himself. Uh, he fell on his own sword and he died. Uh, and then uh, the armor bearer saw that he was dead and so he killed himself. And so it says Saul died uh, with his three sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua. Uh, were the three sons of Saul. And all three of them died that same day. Uh, and so Israel was defeated. Uh, they took uh, the, they cut Saul's head off. They carried it to the temple of Asheroth. Uh, and they fashioned the, they fashioned the walls of uh, Saul and, and his sons uh, to the city of Bethshan. Um, when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done, then they sent some of their valiant men up there and they took the bodies down uh, and, and cremated them uh, and took their bones and buried them uh, under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh, uh, which is where they were from originally. Uh, that was Saul's home. And so uh, they said they fasted for seven days. Uh, David, after he got back from fighting against Ziklag, he came by against the Amalekites. He came back to Ziklag. Uh, and on the third day, there was a man came out of the camp from Israel uh, and said that Israel had been defeated and that Saul and his sons had been killed. Uh, and David said, how did things go? He, did, he was telling everybody this, and David got him and said, okay, tell me how things went. And the young man told him, he said, uh, they're all dead. Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead. David said, how do you know that they're dead? He said, well, I was just happening by there, and Saul was leaning on his spear, and the chariots and the horsemen were pursuing him, and Saul said he didn't want to be tortured, and he asked me to kill him, and so I did. And he said, that's how I know he was dead. I've got a feeling that that guy thought he would get a reward for that. I mean, after all, Saul was David's enemy. I got a feeling he knew that Saul had been trying to kill David and that David was his enemy and that probably now David would be the next king and probably David would reward him for making sure that Saul was dead. But that's not the case. Uh, he said, I took his crown, here it is, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and I brought him here to you so to show you that he really is dead. And so, now, David then turned to one of his men and said, kill him. And his blood's on his own head because he has admitted that he killed the Lord's anointed. And he deserves to die. And so he killed him. And so this, this guy was an Amalekite and he was, he was killed uh, immediately. Uh, Why did David say that he killed him? Huh? Because he said he did. The Amalekite said he killed Saul. He said that David killed Saul. No, David didn't kill Saul. No, Saul killed him. Yeah, but the Amalekite told David that he had killed him. That he, the Amalekite, had killed him. He said, I was there, and Saul was, was about to die, and he was afraid he was going to die, and he told me to kill him, so I did. And David said, you don't kill the Lord's anointed, kill him. And so he killed him. So, so David killed the Amalekite, he had him killed. Uh, and then David lamented 
uh, Jonathan and Saul. Uh, he fasted t- till evening, it says, uh, and then he wrote a psalm or a song and, and taught it to uh, uh, Israel and said that this is one that you need to learn. Uh, your beauty, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. O mountains of Gilboa, let not dewer rain be on you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the field of Saul, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and pleasant in their life, in their death they were not parted. Swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How have the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Jonathan is slain on your high places. I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You've been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of women. How have the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? And so David really lamented the fact that Saul and Jonathan had died. It was not pretend. It wasn't put on. It wasn't like, you know, he really was glad, but he acted like he was sorry. Uh, David really did care about Saul. He really did care about Jonathan. He cared about Israel. uh, And he was truly sad that that they they were killed and that Israel had been defeated. All right. Anything else that covers the story of what's in our lesson? Uh, I'm not sure if we answered any of these questions. I didn't think so. Yeah, I didn't think so either. All right, let's go back to page 65. Following the rejection of Saul as king, God told Blank to go to the house of Jesse and Blank and anoint one of his sons as the new king of Israel. Okay, told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and Bethlehem. One thing that I did skip was before Saul went to battle, he tried to get the Lord to answer him and tell him whether or not he should go. And Saul and the Lord never would answer him. And so he remember he went to the witch of Endor. Uh, and she, she uh, he said, bring up from the dead who I ask you. And she said, okay, who? And he said, Samuel. And Samuel came up and she screamed. Apparently she didn't really think she was going to be able to do it, but it did. And Samuel came up and Saul and Samuel asked Saul, said, why have you bothered me? And he said, because I tried to talk to the Lord and the Lord wouldn't answer me. And he said, well, I told you he wasn't going to answer you. I told you he's not going to be with you. He said, well, what's going to happen in battle? He said, you're going to be killed. You and your sons all die today. And so Saul was, was faint and they prepared him some food and he ate and then he went to battle. And he was killed just like Samuel told him he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had he had gotten rid of all of them because God had told him to. You know, God, that was one thing that God told him to do that he had done was to get rid of the witches. And and if it was, if somebody was found to be a witch in Israel, they were under the law of Moses. They were to be killed. I mean, that was uh, there was no question about that. And and so Saul apparently had at least done that part of what God wanted him to do. And so now he needs somebody to. To, be a, to conjure up somebody from the dead. And so he begins looking. And first thing, when he went there, first thing he, he asked her, said, can you raise somebody from the dead? And she said, well, you know, uh, King Saul, he's, he's gotten rid of all everybody can do that. And he said, uh, she, she said, well, he, he said, well, you know, you're okay. I'm not going to tell on you. And so then after she brought Samuel back, she recognized Saul that he was king. He said, you've tricked me. He said, well, I promise you I'm not going to hurt you. So uh, he, he said he wouldn't, and he didn't. All right, de- describe David's appearance when he arrived in the field, from the field, when Samuel was going to anoint him. 
How does he describe? Ruddy and handsome, okay. There was one other thing said about him. He had beautiful eyes, yeah. I, that's, I, th I think that's sort of an interesting description. Uh, and by the way, I was told, I don't remember if it was last week or week before last week it was, uh, that ruddy is actually a medical term that is used sometimes today, and it means red, like real red skin. Is, is the term is what the term means in medical terms today what was the day what, we'll stop right there there goes the bell that's a good place to stop we will begin with question number three next week Lord willing This song is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, and this I personally like this tune better. It's interesting that the other tune is much more familiar to us, but this one is actually written before the other one was. Uh, this is the original uh, tune, the way the song was written originally in English.
687.
your invitation to become your child as well. Father, we pray that you will be with those who are sick and undergoing treatments and surgeries. And God, pray that you will be with them and strengthen them, heal them, and be with all those who are carrying out your goodwill and their medicine and the practices to get them well. Father, we pray that you will forgive us from our sins as we repent of them. Give us strength when we are tempted to flee the temptation and to find that way of escape. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 25. There we get in verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out, in the ki- and went out to meet the bridegroom. <clears throat> five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in a flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was about a shout, Behold, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins who rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and for you too. So go go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going to a way to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open us, open for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. We all know the meaning of this parable. Jesus is telling these people that you better be prepared to meet God at any point. Meet because Jesus can come back at any point and our lives could end at any point. And so that that warning, that uh, parable still applies to us today. And we need to ask ourselves daily, am I ready to meet God? Am I ready to meet Jesus if he were to appear this very hour? And so as we're about to sing an invitation song, we ask those who are not a Christian to strongly consider your spiritual state and knowing that you're not ready we invite you to come tonight to get ready to put on Christ in baptism. And if you are a Christian and maybe you're in sin that you're struggling with and you don't feel comfortable with your state of, of your salvation, uh, Peter says in Peter 2, there in verse 10, it says, Be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, and we can have that assurance. So this evening, if you need to uh, respond to the invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saints of earth shall gather over all the other shore. And the road is called the thunder, I'll be there. When
come and uh, help us in uh, doing a worship service for them this coming Sunday. Well, it's, a, it's a good thing. If you haven't been, you need to go because it not only benefits the people that are there at the nursing home, you will be benefited by going, I promise you. Uh, it makes you feel better for having gone and, and share a little bit of the worship. Is anything else? We'll have a uh, truck or treat at uh, our house, 5 o'clock Saturday. Okay. Um, take a lawn chair if you want to sit down. That's right. We for, God provided the ground. You can bring the lawn chair. Yeah. All right, anything else? All right, Brendan, you may be God, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us for giving each of us the health that we are able to come out tonight to study in your word and Father we just pray that the things that we've done and said that were in accordance with your will and that each of us have been encouraged by being here. Father we just ask you to, to be with Diane as she goes through uh, these treatments talking with doctors. We pray that the right decision we made and that uh, her health will be for your story. Father, well, we just pray that you will continue to be with each of us as we go our separate ways. And uh, we pray that you'll give us the courage to be a shining light in this community that others can see you living through us as we go through our day. Father, well, we just ask you to uh, be with us and forgive us when we do all this. Thank you, God. Thank you.